Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, March 24th school board workshop. This should be our final workshop before, um, unless we of course uh, don't get to all of that this evening and we have a contingency set up for this Thursday. Um, because this um, budget workshop is primarily um, around the finances for the Cape Elizabeth School, um, I will hand that meeting over to our finance chair, Michael Moore. Thank you, Joe. Um, welcome to the fifth budget workshop for the 2015-16 school budget. I will quickly review the agenda for the workshop. Tonight, we will review contingency, revenue, three-year planning, salary and benefits, office of the superintendent, and special funds. Uh, the workshop uh, is being videotaped. Uh, tonight's agenda will be as follows. First, we will welcome public comment on the agenda items I just discussed. Uh, before we open up to public comment, I would like to share a section of the Cape Schools Mission and Vision Statement. The ethics portion of the Cape Schools Mission and Vision Statement reads as follows. We value decision making and actions guided by principles of personal integrity, empathy, responsibility, and respect for self and others. These are the ethics we hope our students will develop and nurture. Keeping these in mind as we proceed tonight, should we be hard on the issues? Absolutely. Should we be open to different views and perspectives? Yes. Should all of us here tonight proceed with a commitment to respectful and thoughtful dialogue? I believe we should and hope we do. Uh, thank you. I'd like to open the meeting up to public comment. Uh, please introduce yourself and try to limit your comments to three minutes. This will ensure everyone has an opportunity to speak. For those new to the public comment format, if your comments include specific questions, hopefully they will be addressed later tonight during the workshop. If you feel your questions were not addressed in the workshop discussion or you need more information on an issue, please email the school board. Uh, without further ado, let's open it up to public comment. Hi, my name is John Volz. Um, I'm a parent of two kids at Pond, one at Pond Cove and one at the middle school. My comments will not take the three minutes. I just wanted to had a chance to talk with some of you today, and I've been able to attend a number of the budget workshops and meetings, and I just wanted to emphasize a few points, particularly around the instructional support budget. I feel like um, it's important that we uh, that there are some changes and some concerns in the instructional support uh, area, and that when we have a new um, instructional support director next year, that they have enough resources to scope the problem and solve the problem. And as uh, David Hillman and others have talked about, when we know that there's a need, we don't want to write in zero for that issue. We want to have something there because we know it zero is a bad guess. And I would urge that uh, the board consider uh, making sure that there are enough resources for an incoming instructional support director to um, scope and solve the problems in the, that uh, uh, have been uh, talked about and brought forward in the budget workshop discussions. I would also, again, urge the board to encourage setting up performance standards and annual reporting on performance standards, particularly in instructional support. It's an area where there is a lot of data, but we need to figure out what is you we need to look at and track on a consistent basis. And without performance measures, we can't really measure outcomes and we can't align the budget in, in line with our priorities as our strategic, as the board's strategic plan indicates. So I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, time, attention, and thoughtful and responsiveness. And uh, I look forward to working with you to continue to make Cape Elizabeth schools truly excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see anyone else who uh, would like to speak in the public comment format, so at this time we'll uh, close that portion of the workshop. Um, why don't we jump into uh, the areas we didn't complete uh, at the last workshop. So we'll start with uh, a, one of the larger areas to finish up on is salaries and benefits. And um, I would guide everyone to the salary and benefits tab. 
and uh, that has the propo proposed staff changes. Um, so what we're going to do, if you have any follow-up questions on pr proposed staff changes, um, we have all the building administrators here, the DLT, to address any changes. And after we discuss those, if there's follow-up claim changes, then we'll go through, uh, it's lengthy, but we'll flip through the supporting schedule of salary and benefits, which is actually uh, 17 pages long. So um, do any board members have any follow-up questions on uh, the proposed staff changes as listed in your school uh, budget binder? I guess I have a question. David. David. David? No, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, I apologize. I didn't bring this. Where's Jeff? I, I didn't bring this forward um, as a question. And so this is, and I always confuse budget and process. So I understand that. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, tell me about the secretaries. We had a change to the district about four years ago about how we reorganized our secretaries. And I know that we have a change currently for more secretary change. How are we, how are the secretaries, um, were, just reassure me that they were part of the process, that they um, have an, the timing to, they know about the change in personnel, that they have a chance to share with administration their concerns and needs and um, be part of the process. They definitely know about the change, yes. Um, and a couple of them have definitely talked to me about it. Um, and the secretary whose position would be eliminated has actually left to take another position for an unrelated reason. So I have had conversations with her um, in the case of the budget as well. And I've also talked to Deb Braxton as recently as um, this morning just to sort of update her on where the current proposal is uh, to address the needs in the health office. Um, so I would say yes, there has been. Is everybody 100% happy? And, and no, uh, but I'm not <coughs> sure any of us ever are. So, right. so but. I, I understand that, and I guess it's thank you. Um, sure. I'm sure that the process is followed. I just. Um, there, it, there has been a big administrative change over the last few years, and I don't know if we've ever done like an audit on how we're doing because I know people are working so hard. And so I just um, thank you for keeping it part of the process. Is it, Michael? Thank you, David. Um, just so people are listening, we, we discussed this briefly last time, and I was wondering if. Um, Harris could speak to it, uh, on the proposed staffing changes. Originally we were cutting the, we were reducing the uh, director of instructional support to a half time. And this now list is, is being reclassified to a special ed director. And I assume that this person is now going to become full time. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, I think we discussed last time and you gave a nice summary, but um, I want to reiterate it because I want to make sure I understand it and people understand it. that. Um, based on uh, uh, student loads and, and um, industry parameters, um, it's not clear that we need a full-time instructional support person, but we're doing it because there seems to be a lot of, uh, potentially seem to be a lot of issues in instructional support, and that one of the reasons you want to do this is to have this person basically be sitting at Pond Cove slash middle school and basically root out what are the issues. Are they are they real issues? Are they not real issues? Are they are the staff really overworked in spite of the fact that our, we seem to be wonderfully staffed versus our competitors? And what are the real issues? What's really causing it? And uh, explain to us as the year goes on or by the end of the year, okay, we fixed them. They either weren't any. Or well, there were some, and we fixed them, and here's how we fixed them. And that's what this person's uh, half, or well, some portion of their job is going to be to, to take a look at all these issues and figure out whether or not there really are any, and if there are, fix them. Is that essentially correct? I would say that's a fair characterization of what I said. I think in part there's a discrepancy between what 
we are hearing as administrators and what the board has heard as some of the concerns that were identified and at any time you have that sort of mismatch of information, there's a problem. Um, and I think we need to root through that and get to the bottom of it. And I think, um, you know, given our numbers, I would agree with you. I don't believe that a district our size with the percentages of students we have and um, should need a full-time director. Um, you know, given our overall administrative capacity, but under the current circumstances, I think it makes sense as we move into um, bringing a new director on board to try to take a look at what's going on and have someone who is available in the buildings and that co-supervision model to provide some support and um, figure out where the real issues lie. And uh, uh, thank you. Um, to add to that, we're adding a uh, half-time human resources, we call them human resource specialist. I would assume that that person would also be somewhat invaluable in assisting in the evaluation of some of these pers potentially personnel issues, communication issues, and so forth? Typically, no. Um, the, the supervision of personnel is done at the building administrator level. Um, HR okay. specialists don't typically have the knowledge and experience and education that building administrators bring to the table. So I would not expect that person to be doing that. To the extent that there are issues or concerns, he or she might be involved in airing concerns. I guess that's what I was thinking of. If there appears to be a dispute about a particular issue, a human resource person is actually fairly skilled in, in mediation. In uh, labor law. Well, it's not necessarily labor law. It's, it's, it's really more of finding out with people, sitting down with people and acting as a mediator, to find out what is, mediator is probably too strong word, fact finding as to what the real issue may be. Yes, that person certainly could play a role in that. I would think that would more likely fall to the, okay. the business administrator in the way that we've structured the HR position. It isn't a, a, it isn't the same level administrative position. It's really more of a associate assistant level position, but certainly could be could play a part in that, depending okay. on the issue. One more question. Um, we've had some questions about a behaviorist and. We've heard a lot of discussion about how we're already equipped to handle those, and it isn't necessarily reflected in the staffing thing, but maybe you could just give us, I got a little confused as to, um, I think I know the answer, but it'd be nice if you summarize for us all about how we are staffed to handle behavioral issues. So I'm going to actually let Jane do that, and she provided you an updated sheet that has some of that information tonight that spells out the hours that we contract for. So it looks like it's about the third from the bottom of the pile that you may have received, and it um, is a stapled. Right, so if you go to instructional support tab, you go to the, the pink sheet. It's under instructional support. It's not the one that's called comparables. It's the next one called special education department staffing. Are we there? We're there, thank you. Okay. So this is broken up into three boxes initially, one box for each school. The first column um, lists the school, tells you how many students as of uh, March 23rd that we're serving at each school. And then the positions are listed down the side. They're all in the same order. The middle column is the current staffing and the um, far right column is the projected staffing. So I think there was a little bit of confusion, excuse me, confusion. Um, if we look at the second page of high school staffing, there were five anticipated positions. Um, one of those positions is a staff person on leave. So we started the year with four special education teachers instead of five. And we felt very comfortable starting the year with four special education teachers, not five, given the caseloads. Toward the end of September, early October, there was a need for support in the writing process. And so we advertised for a teacher, special education teacher. We did not find one. We advertised a couple times. We interviewed and we did not find one. So we used that funding to hire a .5 literacy specialist for just this year who is working with 
general education teachers, and special educators supporting young people in the writing process. So this current school year we have four special education teachers and then an added literacy person for point five. So I think that might have been a little bit of a confusion. And David's question about behavior specifically. Okay. So then moving on to the next page, we can see some district-wide services described. Um, a physical therapist is projected currently 0.6 projected to be 0.5. School psychologists, we have 1.8, and that has been a consistent service in the table of the school department budget. Two additional days, one day for each, is, are funded through local entitlement or federal funds, so they're both here five days a week. Um, both psychologists serve students K-12. Their primary responsibility is to complete the evaluations that are required by special education regulations. Additionally, given the extra day, they're also able to spend some time consulting and supporting educators. One of them, as you know, is a BCBA, and so that would be the focus of the additional support she can provide throughout the district for behavior challenges. Can you just repeat what a BCPA is in case? That's a, a board certified behavior analyst. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, toward the left on the bottom, you see a description of the contracted services. I think it's important for me to, to reiterate that we have had all along since September contracted services to support the behavior challenges that our young people may have been experiencing, especially at the Pong Cove School. We had a psychologist as well as our BCBA providing services and you can see the number of hours that are there. The district psychologist with the BCBA credentials to date has provided 139 and a quarter hours of consult. That's about 10 hours a week since September. She's now currently beginning March 30th going to be providing 15 hours a week and all of that with the exception of an hour, will be dedicated to the Pong Cove School. Additionally, the district was providing, since last spring, a PhD psychologist for consultative services for behavior and programming for students with autism at the Pong Cove School and one student at the middle school from September through February. That psychologist provided 112 and a quarter hours during that time period. The second contracted services provider with the expertise in autism and the behavior um, with the doctoral level credentials, um, a senior behavior analyst began with us March 3rd and will be with us by contract through June 30th. Um, it is my recommendation that that person be retained and as I said to you last time that that person not only provide additional consultation hours, but also some very needed professional development for the staff. She's provided me with a proposal that um, looks very good, and um, I would suggest that that really is one of our strongest needs in that area. Just because I'm looking at this chart, the, mm -hmm. the first one on the contracted services, it's fairly clear that that person is going to be... Um, I assume that all three of those persons, the district psychologist with the BCBA, the second one with the PhD psychologist, and the third one, the second contract, are those going to be provided in 215, 216? The top one and the bottom one will. The middle one has left. Okay, so the we'll district. have, we'll have uh, we basically have two specialists, the district psychologist and a contracted service provider? Correct. And in addition, if I may jump in, we, my understanding, having done some research as well as talked to some people, that virtually everybody uh, from ed techs to special ed teachers have training in behavioral techniques, basically B.S. Skinner, um, and uh, also the teachers themselves have training in this. So basically, we actually yes. have multiple layers, teachers and special ed people, and then finally the highly specialized people. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Looking at it a little bit um, differently, maybe, you know, uh, it says we have 1.8 for 1415. 
um, but one person's on leave. So from a actual in the district, you know, is it uh, we're, 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 we have one less psychologist than we will next year? Is that fair to? We, we've picked up a contracted service to do some evaluations to okay. supplement the one um, that is here full time currently and the um, our BCBA level psychologist is just providing the behavior support. Someone else is doing the evaluations to help out with that. So is it fair to say that we have one of the psychologists is in the district right now focusing on that's the psychologist that has uh, so employee of the school district that has BCBA credentials? Correct. 10 hours a week, soon to be 15. Right, but that's where I was, you yeah. know, so it's a full-time per, uh, um, yes. I'm a teacher, and I'll just give you a scenario. And I'm a teacher, and it's one thing to have contracted services where they're here three hours or five hours on certain days, but the students are here, you know, as we all know, mm -hmm. their their needs aren't on a, on a schedule. So we have someone in the district now that if I'm a teacher and say, you know, I need to meet with someone, some consultation on this student. There's someone who's a full-time employee of the Cape Elizabeth School well, our District. Our psychologists are equipped to do that full-time anyway and do a lot of consultation around behavior. A BCBA has specific training that goes beyond that and is typically only brought in in schools to deal with students with autism spectrum disorders where you're doing really specific programming. That's not to say that that's exclusively what they do, but it is, I would say, 95% of the time what they are brought in to work on. Um, they do do some consultation around other behavioral challenges um, and certainly can be supportive in that. I mean, beh behavior has moved beyond Skinner. Um, but <laughs> I didn't say, my, re name, I didn't say my research was complete. I just said um, some. But, but they, they certainly um, can provide some coaching and support. It is, a BCBA is not the person who is hands-on managing behavior. They are there to coach lay out plans essentially, provide training to staff as Jane referenced, and then it's the responsibility of the staff to carry out the behavior plans. Okay. So that person's in the district now and will be in the district in, for 15, 16. Correct. The person is in the district part-time now and will be back full-time next year. That was the leave the board granted last year. Oh, yeah. I'm just trying, you know, it's a rate of change. If you have someone that's working half-time and they're, you know, the perception, for, you know, and this is the hard part is, you know, if there's someone, we have two psychologists, well, if one is on leave, well, they're not here full time. So you could have two psychologists in the district this year where from a time standpoint, one of them's half time. Where you can keep your staffing the same, two psychologists, two next year, but both of them next year will be in full time. Uh, available not 24 by 7 but during school hours so that's um, helpful John uh, I want uh, to switch back to the, the director position and the, that reclassification um, the last time we spoke about this position you had gone through essentially a, 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 a separation of responsibilities for the position that you imagine so that the principals, the director, the director of instruction, and the HR person were each taking some of the roles. Can one of you, either of you tell us how that, how you see that changing with the full times? I don't see it changing at all. It's the same proposal because the other half of that position is going to be needed to sort of get to the bottom of what these challenges are in special ed and provide the training and support and so the, so the director of special education will be special education and 504s, and gifted and talented and ELL will be Ruth Ellen, and HR will take affirmative action, and the principals will still do a greater share of the evaluation. Okay. That sounds, that sounds phenomenal. I, I think that's a great change. Yeah. And I think it's brilliant to use that extra time to really get some expertise in there to find out sort of unearth what some of the concerns that have been raised during this process. Um, the question I also have around the reclassification, um, there's a new title or is it just a typo? The Instructional Support Director to Special Ed Director? That's, That's the new title in the job description we gave you a couple weeks ago. 
Okay. Well, however long ago now. <laughs> As budget season occurs. Seems like two weeks. But I'll lose track of time. <laughs> so will these be two different people then? We'll still have a director of special education and this new reclass, or is no, this? No, that is the, re the, it was an instructional support director. It's being reclassified as a director of special education. The same. With GT and the LL going to Ruth Ellen, the umbrella got a little smaller. So now the focus is special education. So with a smaller umbrella, it's a larger title? Longer title? Just a couple extra. I know, it'll be. <laughs> got it. So just to summarize, if so uh, that's another example. We have one, uh, you had instructional support full-time. Now we're going to have full-time director of special education. If the director of instructional support, we don't know the exact percentages, but say they were spending 60% of their time on special education, without a staffing change, you'll have a full-time special ed director that will be 100% focused on special education. So even though there's not a change, it's still one position, the time allocated or resource allocation to special education would increase without an increase in actual expenditures. Is that a fair? Yes. Um, if you could walk us through, um, I know. Well, I'm sorry, oh, but I'm with sorry, the Joe. exception of the additional half-time HR person, that does add to the expenditures overall. Well, it, it could have been misconstrued that with the reclassification that there's no changes in expenditures to that particular line, but in reallocating out I was just talking about the specific duties. job, instructional support to special educator. It's one person. Right. It's, there's no, you know, that person's going to spend more time on special ed as director of special education than they did as director of instructional support. But in order for that person to be able to do that, we're also hiring a point five. We would not be no. creating the HR position if it were only to handle affirmative action. That's a much broader umbrella in okay. supporting work within the town and school in terms of hiring, personnel policy, updates, manu managing files, some of those pieces that we described last week. But I can yeah. say more about that if we need to. No, no, no. I get that. It just bottom line being there's an additional 0.5 to all of the proposed staff changes. Right, I was just talking about the director of special education. I understand. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to make it clear. Okay. I think I made it muddier. No problem. <laughs> it's the budget season. Um, I'm sorry, Barbara. I, I was just going to mention I, the, the consultative models that you arranged that are going to persist into 16 are, are going to be really helpful and you manage. You, you, you segregated out the issue of hands-on managing behaviors, which is a piece of what I think we've been hearing about. And I just wanted to acknowledge and get your reaction to the concerns that, oh dear, sorry. Um, the concerns that um, some ed techs shared recently in a letter that came to all of us about um, uh, staff injuries. Is that, can you comment about that and how you see um, the new director's role helping sort of assess that and figure out what may be needed? Well, I would say we have great consultative support on the two cases where injuries have occurred. Um, and I would say that injuries are part of work when you're um, working with children with some of the challenges that these children have. Um, we, saw, we saw a significant decrease in incidents um, where there were injuries, and, and injuries could include a scratch or a bite or a bruise. Um, we had six, I didn't bring this data with me, but I reviewed it recently. Um, we had six incidents involving one student um, in September, and we've had two since. Um, so if that gives you some sense of, again, these are two cases, and the frequency of that behavior has diminished, which tells me that the interventions have been fairly successful, you're never going to fully eliminate mm -hmm. those kinds of behaviors in, in students, particularly when there are other challenges that get in their way, which can be an ability to communicate. It can be um, a message to us that some of what we have to offer isn't meeting the child's needs, um, and that's, that's what you use the consultative model for. And it's also a piece of having the new director literally live in the K-8 schools and have a better sense of 
some of that flow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. First of all, I thank you for doing this at the, the breakdown for special education by school. It's very helpful. Um, one um, recommendation in terms of resource allocation at the last meeting was there was going to be an additional special education teacher at Pond Cove. Um, so it would go from 5.5 to 6.5. It would be the same at the middle school. And it would be um, at the high school, it looks like four and four. So the question is what, what um, what's the source of the allocation, the, the additional teacher at Pond Cove? So Jane mentioned the special educator on leave from the high school. You recall that leave was granted fairly late. Um, and we didn't find suitable qualified candidates for that position. And Jeff was involved in interviewing for that as was the department chair at the high school and Jane. We went through a couple rounds of that and said, okay, what other options do we have? And so the team at the high school looked really carefully at needs and identified that the greatest need um, happened to be in writing. And so instead of looking for a special education teacher at that point, which we hadn't had luck with, we looked for someone who could come in and do writing um, on a half-time basis because that's really what the need was instructionally and we brought in a person to do writing on a half-time basis. Um, again, we, Jane, excuse me, and Jeff and the team at the high school have looked at student needs for next year and feel comfortable that the four teaching positions recommended in the budget are going to be able to meet the needs of students at the high school. Excuse me, which gives that position, the position for the teacher who's been on leave, freeze that up and that's the position that will be allocated to Pond Cove. So it's a so the total number of special education teachers and I know that's a broad category, um, one of those was reallocated for writing instruction and literary specialists that serves a broader population of than special education this year and next year that's going to be reallocated no it was serving yeah. students with disabilities okay. serving them in typical classrooms and or in a pullout model depending on what the individual needs were and that position correct will be reallocated at pond cove next year and then uh the the current role uh so it's going from the high school to pond cove um did those half-time positions have any other um, casework responsibility that would that position has not the caseloads were divided among the four teachers because the fifth teacher was on leave and wasn't there to do that we started the year with those cases managed by four teachers and again because we didn't wind up finding a special education teacher they remained divided across those four teachers so there'll be no change in caseloads at the high school and so there, there will be a, so the position that's being reallocated from, I guess it's a half-time writing to a half-time literacy will be a new position at Pond Cove as a special education teacher? Uh, it will be a new position, an additional position at Pond Cove. At Pond Cove. Yes. And then there's, there'll be a literacy specialist uh, hired or contracted for the high school? No. No. No, not Ms. at this point. The no. teacher that's on leave is returning. That means you have a pool right. of teachers, and we are reassigning. Instead of putting five at the high school like we started this year, we're reassigning one teacher out of the pool. I'm not identifying names. I don't, please don't start that right now. But um, I'm not identifying people, but one extra person will be placed at Pond Cove instead of having the five that we had thought about this year at the high school. Since we have had a good year at the high school okay. and the need seems to be at Pond Cove so that's why we're doing that so at Pond Cove if they're you know if it's 50 students I don't know what it was last year but if it's similar the caseload would be spread over responsibilities would be spread over more people. more people is that a fair characterization that is I shouldn't ask my reading recovery question at this point because it will be spread over the full. It's not special ed. It's not Thank special you. I know. I know. Okay. Thank you. So this teacher will work with students and regular ed. Okay. Thank you.
Does anyone have any uh, further questions on any of the staffing um, changes? Um, as, we, as we leave that teacher unfilled, I just have a question for Jane, because it's despite staring at this for a long time, I'm still fuzzy about what local entitlement can fund, Jane. And should someone come in and feel there was additional need for a position, what's local entitlement able to fund staff-wise? I noticed a, one of the speech and language people went under local entitlement. I don't know if that's because they had a certain task. Can you just clarify for us? Local entitlement can fund teacher, speech and language, OT, PT, okay. contracted services, psychologists. And you use that often in response to um, time-sensitive needs that arise in district? Um, for the most part, it has historically in this district been used for professional development and supplies and materials and equipment. Mm -hmm. We try not to put personnel in local entitlement because you have to pay 20% additional funds right. for mm -hmm. right. um, benefits and retirement. Yeah. So um, when I arrived here, the local entitlement budget was quite lean and resulted in some significant staff um, changes immediately. Um, that year there was very little opportunity for much of anything but a few supplies. Since that time, that money has been managed differently and we are um, well managed to be able, should there be a great surprise, um, to be able to absorb that and continue to have supplies mm -hmm. and professional and learning problem. opportunities. So on the February one, to flip back to their proposed staff changes under it's the first tab, hopefully in your binder under salaries and benefits. Does anyone have any follow-up questions on any of these proposed changes? Uh, Mayor, before we flip through the lengthy salary and benefits schedule, um, it might be helpful to just give the headline drivers for you know uh, medical insurance as well as the retirement. So when we look at a line item that says something like retirement benefits and it has a significant increase, it'll give us a context to assess sure. the change. Well, those are the two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So aside from the, the page that you just looked at, um, you're, you're essentially looking at health insurance. We had projected an increase of 8%, as we mentioned to you last Thursday, and not, had not yet had time to examine in detail. That number went from 8% to 5% being the maximum. We still don't know our specific rates, but we know that the maximum increase would be 5%, so we've placed held 5% in our health insurance increases. And retirement, we know that the contribution went from 2.65% at the local district level for teachers um, and those participating in the retirement system to 3.36%. And then you also add the cost of increasing salaries to that. And so you'll see that's why the numbers don't look like, oh, it only went up, you know, seven tenths of a percent. So the, the rate, so if you went from, what is it, 0.0265 to 3.25, the rate of change, or uh, yeah, three would be, I think, 27 percent increase, just in the contribution rate, and then whatever the salary, if your wages increased, say two and a half percent, the negotiated for teachers, that's why the rate of change could be greater than 27 percent. That is correct, and you'll see many of those lines spread throughout. And then maybe uh, before. So if everyone can flip through there if you have questions, but maybe one more. We, uh, it's hard to generalize a universal, but, uh, you know, substitutes. We've, you know, you discuss some uh, salary or uh, wage increase for nursing. Maybe just a quick overview of substitute teaching uh, wage or uh, increase in the budgeted amount of number of hours. So there are 
substitutes are listed again in multiple places, primarily at the three schools under salary substitutes in that very first section. So if you're looking at Con Cove on the first tab, it's line 871230. You'll see a $5,000 increase in that line. Um, and we've talked about two areas of um, increases to substitute pay. The first being the overall base rate, while our $75 a day base rate seems comparable to all of our surrounding districts, um, we still seem to be struggling to find substitutes at certain times, so we, certainly we were the beginning of the year mm -hmm. and the end of last year. I'm not sure that's been quite as consistent um, as we've moved through, but we've proposed increasing the base rate of pay for substitutes to $80 an hour in hopes of that $5 a day. A day. A day. A day. A day. Sorry. Wow. Sign me up. Sorry. Sounds good. We're going to get a flood of obligation. <laughs> we all pre <laughs> um, So to $80 a day. Thank you. Um, and we also talked about at the last meeting substitute pay for nurses. Um, again, while well, our substitute pay for teachers generally seem to be in range with other districts, most are paying also $75 a day. Um, our substitute pay for nurses was below the average. Most are paying about $125 a day, and so we're proposing increasing the rate of pay for nurse substitutes to $125 a day. Um, so you see that substitute increase is reflected in that $5,000. Somebody had asked about an increase in the number of days for professional development. It is not. It is merely about being able to increase the rate of pay for our substitutes. So I, I don't, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Uh, I know it's hard to do this, but for substitutes and, uh, you know, for any of the schools, uh, you know, increasing 10%, um, but I noticed for several of the schools, you know, if you take Pond Cove, in 1314, the actual was 38,000. We're budgeting 54,000. At the middle school, uh, for regular instruction, it was 34. It's going up to 50. So substitutes is one of those areas where you see great fluctuation year to year. And if you look, were to look at a five-year history, you'd see some under and over numbers. Um, and that's because when you have long-term substitute needs, that those numbers creep up quite a bit. So, you know, it's, Pond Cove definitely had a great year, but anytime you have someone out then subsequent in a subsequent year for a long-term medical issue or a, a birth of a baby or um, it could be any number of reasons under FMLA, you wind up paying a, a higher premium for substitutes. It increases after four, four weeks to the VA zero sure, rate yeah. on the scale, so that's mm -hmm. a substantially different amount that you're paying to substitute. So we generally take a five-year look back at our substitute rates and plug in a number that represents what that five-year look back has, has shown us. So we plug in an average. Okay. Would we take into account um, this year the 15, 16 with the school days, the half days? And so we, for professional development, we shouldn't, I think one of the questions Kelly had, one of the statements Kelly made is that we won't be having as many needs for substitutes for professional development because we'll have those half days. Does that, yeah. does that show I, up in the I think budget? It re I think we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable reducing the substitute line at this point based on that because substitutes are not only covering for professional development, they cover for sick days, they cover for personal days, okay. they cover for, again, for those long-term leaves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Joe. I hate to bring us back, <clears throat> but I will. <clears throat> um, earlier in this tab, there's the staff list by department. I just wanted to point out <clears throat> um, on our updated list, <clears throat> um, that the comparing to um, 2007 to 2008 school year to the proposed 1415 <clears throat> or current 1415 school year, um, the staffing for instructional support used to be 20.5 and it is now 25.6, and the staffing for Ed Tech threes used to be 14 or 15 and is now. 20, almost 22, 21.75. Um, just sort of looking over time, I know that that was one of the questions that we've yeah, been yeah. asked. There's a decrease in EdTech 2s, though, as well, that you have to take into account. But again, our, our overall staffing has remained at a pretty consistent, consistent level, level as you look at student-facing positions. And again, our focus in terms of trying to close the instructional gap or the opportunity gap, as um, some folks prefer to call it, 
has been on having more teachers in front of children, providing that direct instruction. And again, we've seen that make a difference in at least our reading scores at this point. Thank you. I just meant to hit on that earlier, and um, I wanted to make sure we didn't forget it. Sorry to take us off track. Not a problem at all. Um, so I, I'm sure everyone's gone through uh, these pages. Um, you know, I would say, um, I mean, if we do have a teacher retire, um, maybe it's hard to go through it. But if you have, uh, you know, how do we budget for if we have a, you know, teacher retire or that, you know. Um, the salary may go down in that area as well as health care benefits or if you're replacing a teacher. So so we had three retirements this year. Two of those positions are not being refilled. So we have one retirement. So to give you an example of how that works, that often teachers who retire are near the top end of the salary scale, as you would anticipate. But they are also usually on the lower end of the benefit scale, right, because it's that stage of life they typically don't have young children at home so they're not just paying in a family plan or an adult with, with children plan. Um, when we budget for replacements we t typically budget for master's level replacement at seven years with with a full health care plan um, and for the, the cost the district provides for that full health care <coughs> plan and so um, typically you don't see much in the way of savings as you transition from one plan to the other, and bear in mind that the district pays out of the current year, which we don't budget for, a retirement benefit to people un under the collective bargaining agreement. And well, um, for uh, under the middle school, and how um, in the salaries and benefits, in the salaries and benefits. Yep. For, for health, page. yeah, uh, page four. Mm -hmm. um, just at least in the health services area, there's some. There was a change in personnel this past year, right. which netted savings um, in salary, which are reflected there. And also, um, you saw the nursing assistant position is also reflected in this line, right. so the middle school's portion of that has come out of that section of the budget. But most of that is due to a personnel change, and that happens from time to time. Right, and then that's an example of under benefits nurse where their health care selection changes, so right. the benefit increases. The, so. Yes, the, the salary went down, but the benefits went up. Right. Um, and then on page three under um, middle school library media center, one of the other larger percentage change numbers. Percentage change is large um, around the benefits librarian, 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people are, have the right to elect whatever plan they qualify for, and people have family circumstances that change, whether that be a birth or a marriage or a divorce, and those are all qualifying life events, and people make different choices. Thanks and so Thank we, you. under the CBA, pay for their health care. Perfect. I know one area um, that's new in the salary and benefits uh, for the budget is gifted and talented, um, as well as I imagine their summer school. That's page nine. I'm sorry, Michael. No, we no, didn't. I just wanted the, the board aware that those are, uh, um, I guess, that there's an increase for summer school, and then there's a new line item for gifted and talented. Yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And this would just be the salaries and benefits, and I know we've already gone through 
summer school um, that there's also incremental dollars that are funded through special funds um, so for th some, this yes, what, for right. some professional development I know this uh, we've probably all been through this but um, I'm going slow so if anyone has any questions um, they may ask um, I know it's a small area of the budget, but it's one of the larger departmental changes um, would be under the English Language Learner Program, page 15. And it's $36,000, so it's not significant. Oh, I'm sorry, it's $72,000. Um, but is there anything? Uh, it's not of an increase, though. The increase is only about 4000 4, right. So that would be the... Salary, salary steps and, and okay. Yeah. Our English language learning population has remained pretty constant, about kind of twenty students. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe um, go to page fourteen, and then just to make sure. So. Uh, um, I know that one would say, well, there's some uh, budget reductions for unfilled positions in instructional support, um, but actually for total instructional support for salaries and benefits K through 12, the, actually the budget is increasing. Is that correct? That is correct. So th that you would have uh, positions we budgeted for last year that were Unfilled, those are the two positions that would be um, out of the budget for 15-16. Special education teacher and right. the ed, ed tech. tech. Yep. So, when someone, so actually our, at least from a salaries and benefits perspective, is that correct? On page 14, total instructional support K through 12, the budget is actually in, increasing? That is correct. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any other questions, comments? So, uh, you know, salary and wage increase, increase that are negotiated for the bargaining units, and those are different, uh, but I know the teachers was 2.5% that uh, just for the wage, and then for co-curricular stipends, those are negotiated as well. And then medical premiums are 5% increase, and then approximately a 27% increase in the retirement contribution. And just so uh, for the benefit of the public, um, the increase in the retirement contribution rate, that was initially positioned as uh, uh, the state was going to allow local districts to share in funding the retirement. It was a few years ago. Um, so allows, last year. allows an interesting word. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So it's mandated. It is, yeah. That's right. And uh, initially, when it was proposed, it was going to be, uh, you know, a, a rate that initially wasn't going to change necessarily. But now it's a 27 percent. Yes. Increase. So, so there are two pieces. It's the it's both the local district share, and there's always been a local district share of teacher retirement. The district has always made a contribution to retirement. What changed is that the state portion of that dropped. And so we are picking up, as you indicated, a percentage of the state share, and it, those numbers are probably still in your budget binder because it right. wasn't that long ago. Um, and then we've seen additionally the increase in the local contribution based on individual teacher salary and benefits. And in terms of, I know, uh, longer term visibility, that number could be whatever the state mandates it is? Yes, it's not our fun to manage. Yeah. There's legislation pending to move away from that, but I'm not very optimistic. Am I going to have a question? I'm sorry. I thought That's you were right. holding your glasses up. Um, Meredith, tell me every year we do have to keep a, or in the past we've had to keep a line in for preschool students coming in to the district 
for by a state requirement. Is that um, true? No. So the CDS, we don't, we haven't kept funds. No, we have money that flows through local entitlement for mm -hmm. children with disabilities and preschool for transition, but it's a small number, about $7,500 is my ballpark. No, it's more like four. Okay. Okay. And so that's, sorry, okay, thank you. Okay. I thought it was a bigger number than that, that we had a pulled in place. Not for preschool, no. No, I think you may, may I ask, are you thinking of the set aside for students who are parentally placed in the private school, the Ocasisco school, which is in this district? Are you thinking about that? Well, that's that's another good question. Um, well, I know we have to keep monies aside we for do. kids who, um, mm -hmm. who need other services. And I, I thought it was preschool, but it's also no, it's not preschool. K-12. K-12. Right. And we get that number by historic, looking at historic. No, we get that number by the number of students reported to us by the private school that our students parentally placed who have IEPs, and then the state has a formula, and that figures into the beginning of the local entitlement um, application, which immediately deducts it <coughs> and sets it aside. Around it's set point. aside for two years, and then it goes back into the <coughs> district's budget if it's not expended. Thank you. Salary and benefits, it's uh, obviously the largest area of the budget. So we've reviewed all the staffing changes and gone through some of the headline drivers such as medical insurance premiums going up 5%, contribution to this retirement fund, I think approximately 27% negotiated, um, wage increases for collective bargaining units as well as staffing changes. Are there any... Um, I just want to, yep. is innovation support, was that pulled? It was. It wouldn't have been under salaries and benefits. It I was just, okay, I was but yes, it was. Any other questions? If you think of some, you can obviously uh, <coughs> ask them again, Joe. Well, I'll come back okay. when we're almost done, I'm sure, and ask about something that we covered. No, you, you can go ahead. I just, I wanted to um, remind or reiterate that the innovation may have been pulled out of the budget, but it doesn't mean that that's not, we're not seeking support right. for that through other right. avenues. Right. Um, and I'm sorry, I mean, I guess we'll I don't know if this is along those lines. I know it's not the same fund, but uh, the request for um, a new web, you know. Coming up. Right, that's it's coming up. Okay. Office of the superintendent. Okay. okay. But you're keeping Michael right on Good segue. Right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, John. Just, Michael, one other question on yeah. the salaries and benefits. Just trying to square this this sheet, which we just got today, this, Thanks, and the one that Jane went through. Yes, no problem. Sorry? Um, the special education department staffing uh, with the with the budget line items in that um, as as uh, Jane explained uh, in the high school would be going from five to four special education teachers um, Are you asking if the budget currently reflects that in the staffing sheets? It, well, in the in the staffing sheet in the in the yeah in the staffing sheet on page fourteen, it looks like the total budget for in salaries and benefits for uh, instructional support nine through twelve is up one hundred twenty thousand. K through eight, it's down. Um, total instructional support K through eight is down eighty four thousand. For a total budget increase of forty-five thousand, but when I look at the, this sheet, it looks like the staffing is working the other way around. That there's additional instructional support staffing I, in Pond Cove and fewer so special I education that teachers. I, I saw Mr. Wyman when you said it say, "Oh, because I think he had, did not make that change in the budget sheets at this point." Move it around. The total number's in there because the number of staff haven't changed, but I don't think he has made the move from nine through twelve to K to eight. 
at this point based on our could conversation. You, I have read in line uh, account numbers to try to get the right people with the right accounts and the right grade levels. But so the total so instructional support budget increase of $45,000 is accurate, but once we, once, once this is revised, correct. the next color of this <laughs> will, purple. There'll be the increase will be at the Pond Cove, more at the K-8 level, and the reduction will be at the 9 through 12 level. Correct. Okay. And what's not shown here is the additional speech language pathologist covered through local entitlement funds that serves K-5. What case? Well, she's really serving 3-5. Three three five. 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 Oh. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions on that area? Why don't we go to uh, Office of the Superintendent? Anna just asked about the web services piece. On the third line there, 9,100, you see an increase of $20,000 um, entitled or intended, excuse me, for that work. That's our best guess at a, and that's I'm looking at Mr. Harrow who will <laughs> say it's a, it's a guess, uh, but that's our best guess at uh, what it will cost us to convert our website into something that better meets our communication needs today. And that can be maintained by folks within the district. And the um, other significant change is under the second from the bottom, line 907301, equipment and software. And that $50,000 increase, is, again, we described sort of briefly to you, is to update our accounting software system. We do that jointly with the town. Services are payroll, accounts payable and receivable, and all other functions, functions. software. And it is the system that we currently have is pretty out of date. Um, mm -hmm. We can't do. Uh, um, electronic purchase orders with our current system. We can't do electronic payroll deposit with our current system. And we've spent... Uh, are you chiseling? Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, no, but people are literally stuffing envelopes, which is not really the best use of anyone's time or energy. Um, and again, we think that time can be better spent elsewhere. Um, it's a long overdue project, but it is an intensive project. We have worked pretty hard over the last couple of years trying to get our current vendor to make some updates and upgrades, and I would say their customer service has not been um, anything I would recommend. So we think it's the, the appropriate time to make that change, and that's the price tag. And is that uh, the school district's portion of it? Yes. So it's, <coughs> what's the total dollar cost? So it's about $100,000 total. Um, and that mm -hmm. includes the conversion. The first year, you're really paying for two software systems, mm -hmm. um, licensing for both simultaneously because it takes really a year to roll everything over, audit to audit, um, the training, mm -hmm. and the startup. Have you identified a program? No, yet, not yet. We're soon to begin the process of interviewing some options. On the website design, you know, twenty thousand would be the max. But uh, in terms of sourcing different potential local residents that may have expertise in that area, it's, we're going to look at all options to. People have that expertise and want to write into us, mm -hmm. and I'm sure Noel would be more than happy to talk with them and test their capacity. Um, you know, right now, well, I won't characterize our current state of. <laughs> website design, but it's very piecemeal and it's very hard for the end user to operate, and uh, that's that's not helpful um, for communication purposes today. 
And that's a big project, and it will be, it'll be tough to to get it done with that budget, mm -hmm. and it, to get it done under that budget may require that certain aspects of it are completed by uh, community volunteers or done in house. Um, it's a really, really, you know, large and complex website. Sorry, Susanna. Oh no, that's okay. Um, just and just looking forward, once we do have it, the, the I think the uh, important key piece of it will be, you know, unlike what we have now, or, or um, you know, people who are who are always on uh, what are now on call, but on top of the the you know it, the uh, gosh the the, update. um, the updates you know in, in each school and there's a funnel system so that it's not you know like what we have now information here some information there you know so it's all in one central location that's you know, I know one of the goals and hopefully within you know the staff that we have now we can figure that out but once we get there. That's the shared intent. I mean, I would say, I will say, you know, that yes, in terms of funneling and posting updates, that's true. Um, in terms of someone gathering stories and gathering information to post, we aren't providing for that in this budget. You know, we aren't providing for another person to grab stories or grab information and get it posted. So, I, I, that if that's the expectation, this isn't going to fix it. Um, this is going to improve our website itself and will give us the capacity internally, we believe, to have people maintain it mm -hmm. in, in a reasonable way. Right. Meredith, I know, oh, I'm sorry, Dave. Go ahead. I have a couple questions. I'm curious, John, you have a lot of experience in, in computers. Are you saying that you think that the amount we're allocating is too small? I, I actually don't. I'm not qualified to... Um, I don't. I don't build websites. I'm not qualified to. To I know people who do, but um, to really to say, but um, it's. It, I've seen much simpler sites, you know, built for similar budgets. Um, so, I, I. I think it's possible that we could get it done, and 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 I, you know, I. Well, uh, maybe I didn't mean to put you on, but do you think that this is an adequate sum of money? Again, <clears throat> you, what we have to do is develop a work scope of what we need to do. Oh, I think I asked you this question. And then <laughs> we come up with a schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I have to agree with John. It's interesting, um, to say the least, about how much um, $20,000 will get you with this, especially with the size of the website that you're asking for. And the other part of it is to keep it maintained you know, what happens after we build the whistles and the, the pictures and so on and so forth is how that, how, how that is maintained, not only digital, but also the persons and people behind it. Well, I, I guess I'll make a comment and we can discuss it when we, we're voting, but I would hate to have used 20000 uh and, and run short of money than use 30000 and not run short of money. You don't want to be three quarters of the way through it, so run short of money. I'm not going to be short of money. I'm going to come up with a come up with a work scope, put a schedule it together, and do the work resources with it. Okay. Um, yes. Having having been through that process in a similarly complex website, if you can get any kind of web design volunteer from the community, we were able to do it by just purchasing a four thousand dollar platform, and training our frontline staff to be able to keep it updated. So it's possible if anyone in the community would offer themselves up for a little assistance. Be my suggestion. Mm. On the uh, equipment software, the it's a new accounting system, but it, it uh, AP accounts receivable, payroll, general ledger, everything. It's our everything. It's mm -hmm. our substitute system. Our yeah. New and resource then, um, system, complete operating management system. And of the fifty thousand, how much is is the most of that for labor for integration or the? That better than I. It's going to be about sixty thousand for the software and the program, and then the maintenance fee, and then another twenty thirty thousand for conversion and assistance and training. And we're we're, we're supporting half of that. Yes. Okay. 
Hopefully it won't be as much, but there's not a lot of competition in the market for a combination of municipality and school system. Because we also, from a school system standpoint, we report back to both the Maine State Retirement System as well as the Maine Department of Education, which is unique, where municipalities don't report back to the state agencies. And it's very specific on how we have to report. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions on the office, David? Um, Mary, you came up with an, uh, a proposal that I, I think has been well received about hiring a consultant to look at some of the um, cultural issues we may or may not have. And I uh, don't see that as a line in here. Uh, and I'm con I'm, I want to raise the question, that person I assume is going to be a fairly expensive process. My forty to fifty thousand, um, potentially. potentially. In, in which case, should we? Would it make sense to put a line in here for that? Um, so my hope would be that a lot of that work gets done between now and the end of the year, out of some available funds currently, uh, where we've had some savings due to position changes and fuel savings and those pieces. Okay. Um, so my hope would be that we're able to manage the bulk of that work this year. So at this point, I'm not prepared to ask for money for next year. Um, you know, if we see that as an ongoing problem, I will come back to the board and say, this is an ongoing problem, and here's where I propose those fun funds come from. But I, at this point, I don't I don't feel a need to so present that into next year. The, the, um, you think that work, that scope work can be done this year from this year's budget, which is why you haven't? OK, thank you. All right. Uh, Moving on to special funds. Um, so maybe before we look at numbers, uh, I know on a different spe section we went through, I think uh, Ruth Ellen provided some data on professional development. There's different, uh, you know, Title I-A, Title IIA. Um, so maybe just a brief overview of, you know, what are federal funds and how do we know what we're going to get? Do you want to start? Oh, well, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I, I mean, yeah. as a, you know, so, it's across so a lot of... Federal funds come in buckets. They're allocated for particular reasons. And they generally are sent by the federal government to the state, and then the state has formulas for determining how those monies flow to local districts. That's, that's the big picture. Um, Title I are, are monies that we historically in this district have used to support our... Um, Reading recovery program, and you can see, or maybe you can't see, yes, on the second page, or maybe it's your first page, um, you can see that the total amount of monies that come to us are not huge. They don't pay for a full teacher. They pay for about, well, less than half of a teacher. Um, and so that's where the Title I AA monies have gone historically. Title I-A also requires that you set aside some money for homeless students um, to provide supplemental services and or transportation to those students. So there's a small piece that, that gets set aside for that. Title IIA, um, at one time this district was used for a class size reduction. So used to fund a teacher at Pond Cove, third grade or below, um, to help keep class sizes down. Um, as we looked at coming, and uh, we, Pauline and I, um, about three years ago now, looked at the use of those funds. As Jane mentioned, when you pay for salaries out of federal monies, you also pay for the benefits. And as we looked at really how that money was being spent, it didn't seem to be the best bang for the buck. Um, so we moved the teacher salary into our operating budget at that time and shifted the Title IIA monies into professional development, which is the other allowable use. It's high quality teacher and administrator professional development. So that's where, again, we fell in detail those for you last time, but that's where the Title IIA monies go. Um, then you also have the IDEA federal funds, the local entitlement funds. You can see the details for 2014 and 2015 laid out for you. But as Jane mentioned, those are some contracted psychologist services, occupational therapy, 
professional development. Uh, I should can't even see now. It's not the glasses, it's the light. Um, and you see, again, a portion that's paid out for uh, benefits. You see some monies for out-of-district tuition, as well as she mentioned supplies and equipment. And just on how this works, you know, the, um, you know, it has, uh, you know, total revenue, you know, was greater than expenditures and there's carryover. Just maybe walk us through how that works. Well, Jane mentioned a portion of the carryover comes from if funds that have to be set aside under the law for children attending private schools that are within our catchment area. So in our district, that's Acasisco, it's Apple Tree. I think those are the only two. Those are the only two. Right um, so if there are children identified with special needs attending those, whether they are, or if they are attending those schools, monies get set aside. Whether those monies are spent or not varies year to year. If those monies are not spent, they are part of that carry forward, and you get to spend them after two years. They return to our local budget. So a portion of our carry over is from that. We also typically have carry over because we might project that we're going to need to hire a psychologist three days a week for all year, but we only need that person three days a week for part of the year and two days a week for the rest of the year. There's always fluctuation. Um, we do our best to project for needs, and then we use <laughs> the monies as we need to. And every time we make a change to our local entitlement budget, it goes through a process with the state where there has to be state approval that these are allowable expenditures. There's a review process that has to be approved by Jane, the director, and then um, by someone at the state level. I notice in this one it does have, uh, unlike uh, the restrictions on Title 1A or 2A, if you hire, if you use it for uh, salaries, you have to pay, you know, 20 percent. Is there a similar limitation for IDEA? You yes. pay the same amount. Okay. In, all, in all three. Um, federal funds, you must pay the retirement benefits to go along with them. So the, the, the actuals from 2014 to 2015 rough, roughly doubled, if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, for expenditures? For expenditures. Mm -hmm. So what... what can you explain why they doubled? Well, we're still in 15, but we had a large carry forward. Carry forward. Both years we've had large carryover, John. Um, and so our job is to pay that down. Now, last year we just finished carryover from 11-12. Um, um, and then we had to start on 12-13. So. Wait They've had uh, monies moving runs. forward. Um, we have to pull down first the doubling in cost, more PD, um, some. Um, if you were to look at this budget, we budget to spend four hundred thousand dollars every year, and then due to fluctuations in what actual needs may arise or how things change over the course of a year, we might budget for an out of district placement at the beginning of a year, and that changes as we move into the year. And so we no longer need to commit that tuition money for that placement. And so those monies then become part of the carry forward. So it's a, it's a fluctuating set of monies. I don't know that that helps you. I'm still confused because I, 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 must, I think I heard this wrong. But when, what I heard was I said, why did the expenditure budget increase? And the answer was because the revenues increased. No, we project every year to spend the amount of money that we receive through local entitlement. When when do we, we do that projection? Because it's July not here. when we find okay. out our mm -hmm. numbers, mm -hmm. or August when you find out the the How revenue. How much money we're receiving? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's also important if you have not spent all your previous money. There's that crossover, so mm -hmm. it is a July one to June thirty fiscal year. But if you have not spent your money and you write a proposal to carry that money over, they continue to let you spend the money up until a certain period of time, sometimes up until December 31st of that next year. So even though you've budgeted the new money from 
July 1 to December 31st, if you haven't spent your old money first, you have to spend your old money first, as long as it's related to a project that's been approved. So sometimes what you do is you're, you're already pre-funding part of your year. So you'll have a, a balance at the end of the year, and then you carry that money over again. Okay. So it starts to roll. So the, the, it, the expenditure increase was not driven by an increase in need? Mm -hmm. yeah. The expenditure increase, pieces of that are driven by need, and there's an opportunity to purchase some large equipment, um, smart boards, those kinds of things. There's also was a, an opportunity for some um, district-wide PD that not only encompassed special educators, but general educators who are serving young people with disabilities. Um, that was the jump to 88,000 from 30 and 14. Staff development, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. I guess said another way, you know, we're, we're going to spend the money, all of the money at some point, if it's... Well, it's important that the district does spend the money because if you don't spend the money by a certain point you have to send it back right so and that doesn't make sense because there are always needs especially in the area of professional development now you have all talked at great length about the new director taking a good look at what's going on and what is the need um, I suspect and I you know could be wrong but I think that there's a large need for some very significant professional learning opportunities for some staff and I, that's not uh, an easy funding um, because we're looking at hiring some very um, expert people to come in and to end that learning. There's a long curve in that learning serving young people with autism. So um, that the other piece that was um, an addition or an, uh, was the trip, and we talked about that along uh, last summer. The, the opportunity for both general educators and special educators to attend the seminar in Virginia. There was also um, a group of folks who attended a seminar in New York that had to do with transition from for young people with disabilities who left, who are leaving high school and moving into the adult years. The, um, there's a, a, a strong need in this district for some new thinking around that, and so that was an opportunity that um, has certainly fueled some some new projects and some new thinking. With that said, this year the increase in funds that the district received according to the State Department of Education was a one-time increase. They had extra money and they divided it up. So we had a large carryover and we, we have a large budget at the moment of monies. Um, and even though I explained to Ms. Powers about how it is we can spend that money, we also have to be really careful that we're not um, supplanting what the district should be paying for. So that's why districts end up with a large carryover. Sometimes it's hard to spend it as well. Did I, did mm -hmm. I, speaking of supplanting versus owning. Did I hear you correctly, Jane, that the that the fourth speech and language person is still in this budget? I just didn't see the line for that. Right now that person is um, being funded out of the district funds for the empty position will go back into I local see. entitlement. I see. So we could save the 20 percent. So it'll be back in for yeah. 15. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Thanks. And maybe uh, any we have food service budget. Um, More with us. So the uh, I guess this year's break even for the upcoming year. Um, as Peter indicated, it was getting more challenging. So um, even though it's not labeled, I assume that minus number at the bottom is the is the the deficit. The projected deficit. Correct. Yes. Oh. And in, in terms of entitlement that we went through, if the money's there, we can spend it. It's there's uh, you know we'll get a, a number. Well, this is different, I imagine, in that. Food services, there's a reimbursable amount sort of per meal served under the federal nutrition program. Um, and, and as we talked about 
last month. As you see, there's a cap on how much we can charge for meals. There are rising costs of food, rising costs of labor, and at a certain point, you're going to tip, tip over that threshold where you can't charge enough to be able to sustain those costs. And we're projecting that this will be, next year will be the year. And so that, that $10,000, is there a corresponding line in the school budget that for there, there is not. For that subsidy? No, not at this point. Our assumption would be that that would come from contingency. Are there, are there other assumptions about, I know we're going to get to contingency, but I guess when we do, I'll ask whether there are other built-in assumptions. I, I wouldn't call that a contingency, but we'll talk about when we get to contingency. I know that, David. <laughs> so we're... Budgeting a projected ten thousand dollar deficit in food services. We are. And that has nothing to do with the um, great uh, program and projects that Peter had um, shared with us at the last uh, one of the last meetings. But this is just pure. Money to, uh, to uh, the cost of food and labor are increasing faster than the lunches. Yeah, the costs that we're able to charge for lunches. Okay. So, is there a proposed solution to the ten thousand dollar deficit other than taking out a contingency? Or I, I was not proposing another solution. I don't. I, that's our projection at this point. It's a relatively small number. We'll have a better sense of where that is. Um, it's not. It's not a hundred thousand dollar number. If it were, if it were of that magnitude or a larger magnitude than it is, I would feel strongly that there should be a line set aside. The board may feel differently. But at this point, I, I think it's a risk. It just seems odd to me to propose a budget that, or for us to approve a budget with a planned deficit without putting in some um, risk downsides. And I, I feel that the contingency fund okay. is more than adequate to cover potential risk. And I, I well, well, I'm waiting until we get to that subject. Then, uh, we'll, I'll probably make the same point, but we'll wait till we get to there. <laughs> Maybe that's a good segue. Uh, <laughs> almost, because uh, you know, contingencies, uh, you know, can incorporate the expense side as well as if you have revenue okay. shortfalls as well. So, um, you know, given the contingencies, but look at the whole budget, and then you have an idea of all the, your your uh, areas um, that you may need to use contingencies. So, if you go to the first page after the superintendent's narrative, the pink number one that says Cape Elizabeth School Budget Summary. Um, so, um, do you want to go through state revenue allocation and. Um, yeah, I. Uh, Shown allocation is the information we have at present. As you know, that is subject to change up until the legislature takes its final vote. Um, I, I can't say with any degree of certainty that we will receive an additional $447,150 from the state as we move forward. I will say that's what we've been told is the preliminary allocation. And so that's what we've put in as we have historically done. Maybe just to clarify that, the, so the the number we have in the budget, the two point nine eight two million nine hundred eighty thousand two hundred twenty nine, that's the amount that is we're that's the preliminary that's number the, that we've been given by the state for our general purpose. That's the preliminary. And then what we budgeted last year, the two point five three three oh seven nine, that was also the preliminary number. And that went that down. 
Right. So uh, this is just so everyone knows. Uh, this is budget to budget. So we budgeted two million five hundred thirty-three thousand seventy-nine dollars last year. We did not receive two million five hundred thirty-three thousand seventy-nine dollars. It was about two million four hundred seventy thousand dollars, and the town of Cape Elizabeth made up that shortfall. Made up the shortfall. So you may say, so yeah. So our actual allocation, the rate, the dollar change from state revenue to state revenue is more than $447,000. Mm -hmm. Last year, working with the town council in terms of the one town concept, um, Meredith and uh, others worked with the town council on a provision that was a shortfall that said if we make a revenue allocation for state revenue, we won't know what that number is. And if there's a shortfall, um, the town council agreed to make up that shortfall. Um, so our state revenue um, is actually going up more than $447,000. At the same time, um, we can't anticipate the town council is going to, that there's going to be a shortfall. Does everyone understand? Um, so you may get asked, wait a second, I thought the schools were going to receive, you know, 497000 more. Well. We are, but this is budget to budget. Last year, we didn't receive what we budgeted from the state, and the town council made up the difference. Mm -hmm. And we're hopeful. Mm -hmm. Look in the camera. We're hopeful that <laughs> we can um, work with the town council. Given as last year demonstrated, there is little ability for us to, at this point, to know what the state revenue number is. So the trade-off would be we could budget less. For state revenue, the net effect of that would be higher taxes. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's a great solution, and hopefully, um, in line with the one town concept, that will happen again this year. Uh, we, are we now on this top? Yes. I guess I would, I'm, I'm quite concerned with this number, and I'm not sure I can figure out a solution, but. Um, I don't know how many years I've been doing this, but um, state projections never go higher. They usually go lower. And if I understand, and you can know more about this than I do, Michael, that for Cape Elizabeth to have 500,000 more in state revenues than they did the year before, when a lot of towns and cities around the state are getting quite a bit less, anywhere from half a million to a million less, the idea that somehow Cape Elizabeth is still going to get a $500,000 increase given state politics to me is not a wise assumption. That if there, I, I don't think, well, I think given historical trends and given the politics, for us to end up with a, the full 500000 is highly unrealistic. And, um, and I'm not real comfortable with, um, I mean, this is all a projection, but in projections, we don't have to rely on what the state tells us. We can rely on what we think might be a reasonable projection. It's going to be guesswork, but knowing that we've been cut before, and uh, maybe it will, uh, if, if the state actually gives us all the money, maybe it'll be a little bit higher taxes this year, but we'll still have that money the following year that would then be sure money if we came in, if we actually projected less than what the state gave us. I'd rather have money to bring forward to the next year or increase our contingency fund, because we may have other problems, than to come up short and either get the goodwill of the town and give us money, or our only choice then is to eat in our contingency or cut positions. And I, I would argue, and I don't know how to do it, except to budget less from the state put that money in contingency, so if we get it, we have a slot for it, we can keep it. But um, I, I think the risk of carrying it the full amount is greater than, um, I think I've explained this, but in a nutshell, I'd rather not cut positions for what I think is a more likely scenario, which is the state giving us less. And I'm leaving the contingency alone for now, because I can say that a contingency for our expenditure fluctuations, then I would getting end up with more money, a little bit more money than I thought, and using it next year. Does that make sense? 
Uh, it does. But the only thing I would say is contingency is an expense item. So if we have a, whatever contingency is, we we, we can't. Um, you know, you can't spend more than your overall approved expenses. So one area that you could use if you had a shortfall is uh, the undesignated fund balance. That's okay, I, I didn't um, know the, I, I, I'm so, not. So, so contingency is an expense item. Every dollar of contingency is, you know, is gonna, you know, um, is an expense. Uh, Correct. So if you have a revenue shortfall, it doesn't actually necessarily help you. Um, those aren't extra dollars. You know, if your contingency is 150,000 or 180 well, or 200. I, I guess what I was right. saying is, if I plugged in here, and maybe you're telling me I can't do this, 250,000 for state revenue, and increased our contingency by 150,000, and we don't spend it. We're not required to spend a contingency if we don't have a contingency. Right. So that's just an accounting way to make it come out. Now, maybe that's not the best way to do it. I think I asked this question some time ago because um, I do have some accounting experience, but it's usually not with being promised more money than I get. Well, actually, I get that quite often. I get promised more money than I actually get. I should correct that. But I, I think it's a mistake on a probability analysis to, to, to <coughs> plug it in at, at 500000 when I'm reasonably confident given the politics we're not going to end up with that amount, especially given our current governor and some of the other fights going on up in Augusta. And I don't know how to protect ourselves, but that was my throw-out suggestion. I don't care whether it goes to the undesignated reserves or where it goes, but um, we should be getting from our taxpayer what we need to support the budget. It's sort of my theory about what we must do. If we think this budget's a must-have, we should make sure we, we can spend it. And this is a unknown. The only thing I would um, say around your worry about Kate Elizabeth getting more money is, first of all, I Getting less money, actually. I mean less, because it looks like we're getting too much. Um, two things. One is the adjustments I've seen made from preliminary to what you get are usually more in what you experienced last year, 60 to 80,000, not 500,000. And politically, this formula is so airtight that it's not going to be, oh, Cape shouldn't have 500,000. That's politically a hot potato. It's so airtight, it's hard to see how very um, uh, dynamic it is based on property valuation. And, and you all explained it had something also to do with special ed population. So it's an airtight formula, David. So the only thing that's going to hurt us is if the legislature votes to go even below the 42% funding they're at now. And the Ed Committee just came out voting that it be up more. So, so politics are, we need to be pushing back to that 55% funding level, not falling further behind. So I'm feeling a little more confident than you are that we're going to be coming in close to projections. But well, just the historical perspective here in Cape, and my memory may not be perfect, but I remember getting far less than our, the initial uh, estimate we got, and we, uh, what we ended up with was far less than $60,000. Uh, the one, it's not often for slow that we get an increase. It's only happened a couple times. And um, when we did, my, I can't remember it, maybe somebody has better memory than, than I do, but they, uh, what we call the black box up in Augusta, they reconfigured it and, and um, um, I think, in, in, and we got a lot less, and I think, I remember one year, maybe two or three years ago, Portland plugged in their number, ended up about a million dollars short, and then they had to pass a special bill for the legislature to try and cover their shortfall. And we avoided that because we were more conservative with what we thought we might get. I'm being untechnical, but I remember that happening a couple of occasions, um, and I hope you're right. Yeah. But my point would still stand. I'd rather be wrong and have a little bit more money than be right and have a lot less money. That's my fear. I don't see how the taxpayers hurt except for uh, potentially one year's worth of slightly higher tax revenue um, versus our, our schools having to cut something. And maybe the 180000 is enough, but we've actually... Um, 
might as well talk about, can I talk about contingency with this? Sure. We, that's been a multi-year project on somebody's part to get that number up. Mm -hmm. um, I won't say who it was, but um, we've, we've come close to spending whatever we put in contingency. We've come close to spending what we've put in contingency on every year, haven't we, Meredith? No? no. If, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I don't care. Second to last. No, we haven't. This year, uh, we didn't spend out of contingency for either of the prior two years. This year, we are anticipating that we're spending out of contingency for the mold um, for mediation. I remember so one year so. we had two new uh, IS people move in, and we had to come up with some, something like 100. Ten thousand for me, so I don't know. But I, I remember that happening one year, and we were really scrambling. Mm -hmm. And that's all it would take is maybe a couple of kids, and that's sort of the, you know, that's a what did um, I can't remember his name. Uh, one year, super they called it the known unknown. Oh, maybe I'm thinking of the defense that the known unknown, the known, whatever. It's Donald Rumsfeld. Yeah, <laughs> I hate to quote him on anything, but um, well, the, the, well, if, if you budget. Um, if you're comfortable with your expenditures, and then if you want to budget less in state revenue, um, then you actually, if you increase your expended, a contingency, you're increasing your expenses. So it's a little bit. Um, I guess what I'm trying to do is get from the taxpayer so I know I have the money, and then use it for expenses. I mean, it's it's not artful. No. And maybe the better way is undesignated reserve. I was just trying to figure out a way to, we all, can only go to the taxpayer once a year. And I'd rather ask for as much as we need, think we need in revenue to cover our budget. I don't know how to do it. I just made that one up. Because I am increasing our, expen our expenses and therefore getting it from the taxpayer. Um, and if the state comes in where they say they're going to come in, then we have more money next year. We're going to ask for less next year. That's sort of what I was thinking. So the board can utilize its undesignated fund balance funds with approval of the council. It doesn't need to go to referendum. So that is a place to sort of look at where you have some additional funding. Um, that's a little further back in this section. And that, while you're looking for that, I still have some concerns about relying on another entity to give me something that it, I feel maybe I should have budgeted for. Mm -hmm. So uh, I try to explain this every year. Um, <laughs> I'm glad Scott's in the district. So either this year or next year, I, I'm relinquishing, relinquishing this uh, explanation. So undesignated fund balance is uh, um, the guidelines from our accounting firm is the undesignated fund balance should be between two to three percent of expenditures. So if you take twenty-three million seven hundred and thirty thousand forty-four dollars and pick uh, two percent, you know you should. The recommendation would be to have an undesignated fund balance at least of four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Um, if you go to the undesignated fund balance page under 1415, um, where it says anticipated of 250,000, and then it says proposed of 400,000, the proposed should say 250,000. So in other words, um, we're gonna we ended 1314 at 560 at 8,684. Um, the Anticipated fund balance just for 1415 is 250,000. The proposal on that sheet we just went to is 250,000 in revenue. So if you carry into 15, if you 16. carry into 1516, it would be 568,684, uh, which would be approximately two and a half percent of uh, projected expenditures, which is within the two to three percent. Um, so this is an area where, um, to David's point, um, you know, you could say, well, do we want to carry forward 250? You know, what if we don't get, what if we have a significant state revenue uh, cut? Um, you know, we could recognize less as revenue, less of 250,000. Now, 
if you look historically, um, you know, 250 actually gets us back to uh, um, the level from 2003 to 2011, 12. If you want a history on why 12, 13, and 13, 14 were higher, if you remember there were some uh, Medicaid revenues um, that we lost, so this was to offset uh, some of those. So 250,000 would be more in line with historical revenue levels. Um, and the ending balance would be 568,684, which would be one source of cushion if the state revenue was um, below the initial estimate. So you're explaining that one, one thing we could do to accomplish, so, uh, to hedge against the risk of a reduced state revenue would be to carry forward a lower number from un undesignated funds to recognize that as revenue. So for example, we could recognize 150,000 as opposed to 250,000. Yeah. And then if we received reduced uh, state revenue, what would be our opportunity to add to what we were carrying forward? Uh, well, we that, have the ability to do that, and the, if if the state revenue comes in at that one hundred thousand short, are we able to with approval of council? Yes. You have to go to the town council for approval for that mm -hmm. for one hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Right. So, in other words, if if we something happened and we didn't get the you know truly four hundred ninety seven thousand, say we had flat state revenue. The first hope would be the town council in line with the one town concept like last year would make up for the shortfall because the undesignated fund balance at the schools is 568. I think the overall undesignated fund balance for the town of Cape Elizabeth is, it's multiples higher. It's, you know. A lot. A, a, a significant amount in that. So the trade off, if we're going to, you know, build up our own designated fund balance. There may be less of an appetite for the town council to make up the shortfall. So, there's no easy solution to this. The good news well, is, is the town, what, what under what arrangement did the town, town council make up for the shortfall this year? It, it was a uh, it was a proposal made to the town council that was voted on in. June, uh, I think I believe it was in June mm -hmm. of last year. Correct. <clears throat> Associated specifically with the with the with the with the particularly dynamic state revenue situation last year, right? No. Uh, the value. Wait, no, That's no. been a part of their vote for multiple years. As a, it's the first time we've had to use it. But that's part of the vote that they take every year. It also goes the other way to say that if we get extra money, that goes back to tax. Yeah, I remember that well. Right. Which, is, <laughs> which has happened. Yeah. One. So the, 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 the thought behind it is if we every year budget less than state revenue and it doesn't happen, in effect, each year your taxes are higher than they would have been otherwise. So it's, uh, well, I'm just saying the rationale for it is, well, um, we could we we could do less. We could say we're not going to get it, and you know that 447 thousand change would uh, have to come out of, uh, you know, would be funded by the taxpayer. Well, if so, if you project less one year, in, um, um, and it comes in higher, you don't have to, and you think it's going to be less the following year. You use the money from the first year because you did better. You see what I mean? Why you, it's only a one-time accounting thing, or relatively one-time accounting thing. Okay. If you happen to be right, you if, need the money. If you happen to be wrong... If the town council doesn't take the vote that it is, again, taken historically, that says if you get more money than what you budgeted for, we keep the, di the difference goes back to taxpayers. Which is why I was trying to play a little bit of a game. I'll budget the full amount, but I won't put some of it in current revenues. I'll put it, or I'll, put it I'll raise an expense item, the contingency fee, and put it into that. 
So yeah. we, we, we then book all of the state revenue, but we're not allocating it to specific salaries. We're putting it into a contingency. And the contingency is we get less revenue than we thought we were going to, than we were told. So doesn't that work? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was, yes, you, you, that's a strategy that, uh, that the flip side is um, your expenditures are going to be greater than they would have been otherwise. Right. That is correct. Right. But that, that is if, and I go back to my point, that is correct. It means I have more money because I don't, I, I presumably don't spend that, uh, which I can then use the following year and have less of a tax increase the following year. Or my other alternative is, unless the town wants to give me money, uh, my only alternative is to eat into our existing contingency or um, cut people, cut staff. I'd rather not do the latter. My, my recollection of the two years that we've, that I recall in which we've had mid-year curtailments, yes. in other words, the state has come up with its final, final number and then yes. changed the number, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that those two years, we, we didn't get, one of those years we did get assistance from the town council, but it required a vote at, that, at the time. Um, the other, the we other year, federal monies we had left over we, from something yeah, else. Yeah, I mean there was and there, there were, were spending freezes in the district. Um, there were hiring freezes in the district. There was significant cutbacks were made to to right. stay on budget. We didn't. The town council didn't. It was full, on the order of four hundred sixty thousand dollars, and the town council did not, did, did you know, didn't provide those funds. So. If the town council has historically voted to provide shortfalls in, for shortfalls in state revenue, that's that, that's new to me. I don't. I don't. I know it's been in the motion for at least the last two years. I can look okay. back further. It was my understanding that that was not a new vote. I certainly can verify. Michael, I, but, um, John, I think that the first one of the first years we were on the board that happened. And then because the town council saw that we had, uh, we, our budgets were very tight and we were very responsible in our budgets and that the budget process was so um, responsibly done that they then, we developed the one town council, one town concept um, philosophy. Now, it's a, I don't believe it's written anywhere, which is what I wanted to ask Michael. Can we go over, Mar I, I guess I should turn, no, I think this is to Michael, not you know Ask the away. answer. Okay. I don't know what the question so is. So what is our, you know, how do we have this conversation with town council? Because we can, <laughs> David's right, you know, we don't want to cut, um, we don't want to lose our teachers. We've worked very hard on this budget. You've all worked very hard. We don't want to go back to the drawing board and not have the budget, have a contingent, have issues. So one, can't we have a straight up honest conversation with the town council and find out what our parameters are and uh, that way we get some guidance on one do we need to build up contingency and two do we need to you know build up so we don't have a short because it's out of our control what the state does well and, yeah and ultimately it's out of our control what the town council does so we have an obligation to recommend a budget that we think is a you know, you, yeah. you have an obligation to recommend a budget that's an appropriate budget for the school's needs, and I, so you have to make a call. Right. We can't guarantee how the council will respond. We know what they've done. We know what they did last year. We can be optimistic that that will happen again, or we can be pessimistic. Well, I, right. I don't think it's a matter of optimism and pessimism. In the past, we had mid-year, I'm glad John brought that up, we had mid-year curtailment, and I don't know that that the town council vote this last year took place. We knew we were cut by the time it came time for them to make this determination. We got mid-year cuts before. And that's not to say it won't happen again. It's happened sure. at least a couple times since I've been on it. And I don't consider it. And one solution, and this is, uh, I know in two budget meetings when, um, there's proposals to have uh, to reduce the amount of revenue from use of undesignated funds. So if you go back to that uh, undesignated fund balance, 
it's by design that the amount we're carrying is greater than it has been. It's it, it's greater than it has been over the last three years. There were years where it was 248,000, 223. So, um, you know, there's a, a reason that you try to manage it to where it's, um, you know, it's a sufficient amount if you have a reduction in state revenue, that there's funds available. There were some years where when it was 223000 that obviously that was out of the recession, but that would not have covered your, your shortfall. So mm -hmm. I can't provide future guidance to school boards, but, you know, if you have a year where you don't get great state revenue and you want to reduce the tax impact, you know, just be mindful that you may be a hero in one budget, but if you don't have a sufficient undesignated fund for when something negative happens, it's not, it won't let you offset this, the change in state revenue. Well, that I was more for but I, I, that, at that, increasing that, the contingency expense line. But my point is, you have, it's a $568,000, uh, you know, undesignated fund balance, you add in, $180,000 of contingency, and you may say, you know, it's contingency, so you, you don't know how much you're going to use. Well, isn't 568 about 2.5%, which is what we're, what's recommended? It is recommended, In which but... In case, all those years we did 250, we were probably doing it below what our accountants were recommending. Right. 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 Are you suggesting, Michael, that we I'm need saying essentially you need to look carry at forward less of our unreserved fund balance? So that we I'm just that saying available. you need to look at... The 2.5% to me is just accounting guidance. Uh, you, to frame 568 is that if we didn't get any, if we had zero increase in state revenue, you know, you wouldn't, you, you, the undesignated fund balance would help, is sufficient enough to, to offset a scenario in. where you have flat state revenue, even if the town council didn't. But then we be, fall below accounting standards for the for what we end up with at the end of the year. You well, yeah, you, it would be a you know a unusual scenario. So you, you you can't you know you if you increase the contingency and increase the undesigned fund balance at some point, in the question you ask is well, what's a sufficient amount? Um, and I think you know five sixty eight. If you want to do anything, you can reduce. You know the two hundred fifty thousand in revenue from use of undesignated funds, and that would give us more cushion, as opposed to doing the contingency. Um, oh, is that again, Michael? Sorry. I got that. Well, I'm slower. I need it explained to me. If you increase your contingency, you're increasing expenses. I understand that. So it's like, well, why, why, well, is, why is your contingency going up? And when we went through this last year, I was much more worried about contingency when we had a very small. CIP budget. So now there were, if there's a issue in the district where a roof fails, there were years where a roof would have wiped out our entire CIP budget. For now, we have priorities, but if we had to, if there was some large CIP item, there's enough funds in there that you could shift it. So I went through this last year. So what is there a scenario where I don't think our CIP budget could be reprioritized to offset that? No, I don't think. I mean, bearing a, a large, you know, if a roof or whatever, we would say, well, maybe we don't do as many waterproofing upgrades and we take care of the roof. So I don't think that's a big item, um, you know, as big as it was historically. So in other words, the contingency may be 180, but one of our bigger areas of concern historically was, you know, CIP. Those are large dollar items. Right, but there was another uh, area historically, and that is uh, people moving in, uh, which all of a sudden creates significant costs. It's not just roof, roof falling. Oh, sure, but um, yeah, that's uh, right. And, so, and I think Barbara asked that question, or asked that as a question a little bit earlier to say, is there some room in the local entitlement budget through federal funds that flow through in special education? to be able to address some needs if they should arise? And the answer to that is yes. So I would support moving forward a smaller amount of, from the undesignated fund um, 
based on the un the uncertainty of an unfinished state budget process, which could be finished by now, but isn't. Um, and and you know, and on the fact that um, you know w this is a uh, this is a good year for rebuilding our undesignated fund balance. Um, we have the retirement of some debt and some other circumstances that lead to a you know a, a, a very small um, total budget increase, um, and that that a smaller carry forward would would protect us both against a, 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 a both against a, 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 a smaller state revenue than currently projected, and in next year's budget against other unexpected uh, uh, contingencies uh, in our state revenue. If you look at the, the swings in the state revenue number, you know, you, you get a good year from every third or fourth year, you get a good year, but the next year they wallop you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I'm with you, Barbara, on the, on the, you know, the formula being airtight, but the formula is also based on um, numbers that change radically from year to year, and so there's very so it, there's not a lot of stability in it, um, and, and, I, and you know that, that, that that's. Would you would you are you saying you'd take a hundred thousand less of undesignated fund? Yeah, so I would change. I would I would support changing that carry forward from two fifty to one hundred and fifty. And one thing to consider, uh, you know, what increases undesignated fund balance? It's if you're you're spending less than you budgeted, which someone would say that's great. I would say, well, that's good budgeting. I would say, well, no, good budgeting means you're spending. Perfect budgeting means you would spend exactly what you budgeted, less the contingency. Um, so, you know, going forward, if our contingency is 180,000, if it worked perfectly, the undesignated fund balance should only go up by 180,000 a year. In other words, I don't think going forward we can hope, you know, we had um, in the last few years, you know, some, uh, you know, we had a no uh, middle school principal. So that, was a budgeted item, but that increased it. We had didn't have a business manager, so going forward, the growth in the undesignated fund balance will be much smaller because we're budgeting tighter, and we need to spend the dollars we're budgeting. If not, we need to answer, well, why aren't we spending those other than contingency? So um, I, I like John's idea. Um, or Barbara and John's idea. Um, now, just so everyone knows, if you reduce the amount of revenue from use of undesignated funds, it's a it it comes out of it's a tax. It increases the tax amount. Does everybody understand? Yes. We did this last year. Yep. Everybody remember? Yeah. Um, now before. Uh, but I think that helps make it clearer for the folks who are voting on the budget <clears throat> that we're trying to make this responsible for the here and now and not once the budget's passed, we then find out from the state something happened and then the town council has to make up for it because then it still comes out of the taxpayer's wallet in the end. We're trying to make the prediction of what people are actually voting to spend on a little more predictable. Right. By doing that, and next year when state revenue declines potentially, that's when you could use your undesignated fund balance to reduce. In other words, in years where we have more in state revenue than you think, that's not the year to, you know, to use your undesignated fund balance, which is David's point. So one solution, David. How you doing? Fine is, you know, to reduce the amount of undesignated fund revenue. So next year when we get a, it's going to be down 200000 that's when you 
allocate more to. Mm -hmm. As I said, I don't care which pot you use, as long as right. you have a pot. And of course, undesignated fund or contingency. Well, another way to look at it is that the, the, what the school board is endeavoring to do is to level out, out the, the volatility of the state contribution through the, through the judicious application of undesignated funds. More in years when we have reductions in state funding and less in years when we have uh, increases in state funding. And what we're trying to do is 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 keep the, the impact on local taxpayers to be you know predictable and and reasonably level in in the in an environment where the state contribution is is all over the place up down twenty six percent up twenty nine percent down three percent up seventeen mm -hmm. percent mm -hmm. well j just so people know I understood the accountant uh Pauline explained to me a couple of years ago that the undesignated fund balance is a form of a reserve, or whatever you want to call it. It's not quite a contingency, but it's sort of like a, a reserve. So it's not inappropriate to use some of that money for uh, a cushion. So before we crunch the numbers and all the changes, uh, uh, so John will uh, come back to that um, maybe after we look at uh, well you don't need to flip to contingency it's uh, 180 thousand is the budgeted amount for 15 16 14 15 it was a hundred and eighty thousand and 13 14 it was a hundred and forty thousand I remember it well. so um, so if you have too big a contingency, it's, well, how, how do you not know, uh, you know, you know, what, what are you imagining that could be that big of a, a, a surprise cost? Um, and CIP, even though this year we actually used it for the mold, um, you know, that reduces that, but there's no perfect amount, um, the range from our peer districts when I looked at it last year, it was something like forty thousand to, you know, a hundred thousand. Um, so, it, the budget proposed budget amount is one hundred eighty thousand. And I, and I would answer by saying that you know one that one out of district placement can could consume the entire contingency. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and we have one in there too. It, I mean, it, it's it's. And one teacher uh, will consume almost half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One one additional teacher because of we have to hire because of student need would consume half. So, I think there's it's easy to imagine uh, how that amount of contingency could get used. I don't. I think I appreciate what you're saying about perfect budgeting, but there's there's really no such thing. We can have you know perfect people in, involved in the budgeting process, but we can't predict the future. Right. I would assume that any school that has forty thousand dollars of contingency has money scrolled away and things not called a contingency and, uh, and other funds because other they're just nutty. They don't ever get out of district placements. So, so maybe uh, I don't. Which we used to do that. So given uh, you know, I think food service. I know uh, they've done a great job. It is projected to be a deficit. So. You know, I propose you know to keep our contingency, a true contingency, at 180. You know, I recommend we you know increase it to 190,000, which would be a flat. Um, you know, build increase that expense item. Yeah. Okay. So instead of 180, you know, do it 190,000, and then. Um, I think Michael, you just clarify, have we put back in the budget There's all the jobs that Meredith has done over the past? The technology director, the middle school principal, the... Um, uh, yeah. All those positions are in the budget, if that's yeah. what you're asking. Yeah, but um, we did recognize the savings because we didn't pay someone Meredith has to have it on. So that's been back in the budget. Yeah. 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 Not, um, Doubt they would show it for work. It's contributed to the undesignated fund okay. budget. But that's why I'm saying that it's not going to go up as much as it has. Right. You know. Okay. 
we didn't have a tech director, business manager transition, right. middle school principal became a superintendent, you know. Um, so, um, so this is the part of the budget where um, if anyone has any proposals, recommendations, or not recommendations, proposals, dollar budget proposals, uh, I did. Uh, we didn't vote on it. You want to vote well, on it? well, no, I'm just going to list out what's. Okay. Um, so, one is uh, increased contingency $10,000. Um, and then next, well, I won't talk increasing about next year. We're increasing, no. the, we're increasing the expense item for. Where the contingency increases to um, the buffer for the food. Industry. Right, or it doesn't matter. Either we can do a line item for food services. Yeah, so uh, a $10,000, why don't we do a line item that just says food services, you know. Um, That's fine. Incremental funding, whatever we want. You call come up with a, yeah. yeah. Don't call it staffing. Yeah. Let's yeah. just call it food services. Yeah. Because uh, it's not. Expense. Comes into other in your. Oh, I know what you're saying you got to fund a line counts. item. So. Yeah, we have to we have to put it into a line item, but we'll. Yep. Um, a line item within the food services. Right. Yeah. They don't have a. They don't have a line item in our budget. Oh. I assume right. some way you can find a number. That's and then 150 thousand would be the revenue for use of undesignated funds, as opposed to 250 thousand. Use of undesignated funds from 150 to from, from, two, from 250 to 150. Yes. So that would be a net. Uh, so your expenses will go up uh, $10,000 from what's on this. Is that correct? Yep. And your revenue will go down. Uh, your uh, non tax revenue would decline. A hundred and a uh, hundred thousand. I'm sorry, hundred thousand. So your net incremental tax increase would be a hundred and ten thousand. Is everyone with me? Say that last sentence again. A uh, hundred and ten thousand. Um, local expenditure. Uh, local property tax. Oh. Uh, Incremental local property tax increase. 0.5% of the budget. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we're back where we started, more like 2.6. Well, mm -hmm. I have a, before <laughs> we get that. to that, before we call it 2.6, wait, 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 we have yeah. this debate every year, but I'm not sure that it's 2.6. Wait, wait, yeah, there's, uh, no, um, so it, your expenditures, uh, sheet instead of saying 2.1 I don't think it'll register but yep, that 10 you're good uh, instead of being 2.1079 would be like 2.15 percent for expenditures because you're adding ten thousand dollars to a 23 million dollar budget it's um, and then your uh, use of undesignated funds. Uh, your overall revenue would be up 6.6 percent. .6%. Your local property tax revenue would be up. Yes. Your local property tax revenue would be up. Three hundred. Three hundred mm -hmm. and one thousand seven hundred and twenty dollars, which uh, is would be a one and a half percent, or uh, would be a one percent tax increase. Um, let's see what this says. This is not uh, a one point five percent change over the prior year, which is quite. To about the same in tax rate. Back to here. Just right, it would be a one percent increase in the tax rate. Um, by the way, what, this would be a one percent. 
Yeah, the, the footnote. So you're. Um, so I, I had done the calculation right. on the hundred thousand. I'm still working through it on with the change in the ten thousand. But with the hundred thousand dollars, our school department tax rate would go from twelve dollars and nineteen cents per thousand dollars evaluation to twelve dollars and thirty eight cents per thousand dollars evaluation, or a nineteen cent increase. Um, so it's going to be more like twenty cents. Right, so the because I'm trying to write and talk and do math yeah. We know you can do it without glasses. <laughs> I have a question on this footnote, Astra's footnote. Scott. Scott. Yes. Um, every year I argue that the, the appropriate way to frame a tax increase to the taxpayer is what, how much of the percentage increase in their taxes is attributed to the school budget as opposed to net to taxes as opposed to all kinds of other things. The taxpayers only care about how much of the tax is going to go up right. and how much of that's attributed to the school. Is that what the point nine originally was? That's how much the tax is going to go up attributed yes. to the school? Right. Okay. So rounded, it's one percent. Okay. Right. Well, what will we well, use to articulate that? What David is asking, if someone asks you how much, if I support the budget, how much will my taxes increase? They're talking about how much, if I support a school budget, will my total property tax bill increase? Attributable so, to, to the, the, school, the schools. The school. That's one number. Absent, all right. It's and then there's the another tolls. number that says, what's the school quote tax rate? That's a different number. So if someone asks, once we update this, we'll have it clearly that says, this would increase, this would be a blank tax increase over last year's total town tax rate. Whatever that number is, that's how much someone's property taxes would increase. All right From the school. I'm just a little confused about the word total town tax rate as opposed to the school. Well, what number? Th this is if you're if if right sixteen point eight. That's if you're a taxpaying caper of Cape Elizabeth. Um, last year, the mill rate was sixteen point eight. That includes town services, county assessment, school department, community services. That's the total town tax rate. Mm -hmm. um, where the school of the sixteen point eight, the school department portion of that was twelve dollars and nineteen cents. Mm -hmm. So if someone if uh so yeah. would not now be twelve nineteen plus nineteen? Which would right, be twelve thirty eight? Twelve thirty eight, exactly. Okay. Yeah that, that I right. agree with that. So nineteen cents over sixteen point eight. Why why do you do it over sixteen point eight versus twelve point all right. What that quit? No, no, David. You asked if someone asks you how much will my taxes go up due when, to the school. When, when you pay taxes, you pay one. You know, you don't write one check in for the school taxes. So if someone asks you, I, I just want to know what of your, how much will my taxes go up? Then you would do do it over the sixteen eighty. Mm -hmm. If they just right. said apples to apples, just school department over school department, it's a different number. Right. So well, tell me what your question is or not. I, the only way right. I can phrase it, and the only person who's been able to articulate the number for me has been Frank Governor. Right. All people care about is how much are my taxes going up due to the increase in the school? And that's why, in that example, you would use the 1680. That's the total town taxes, total town tax rate. Makes percentage lower, but that's okay. Well, but that's how much, only from the schools. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's why we provide different ways of looking at it. So, um, anyone have any, uh, we're finalizing the calculation. Jeff, how's parking fees? It's 4000 <laughs> Still worth going out um, and checking the parking checking lots as they're benefits in but other areas. Vote. I okay. think there's benefits in other areas. Do you agree with that or am I being silly? We're fine. Okay, thank you. Actually, a school board meeting. Great. Go. At a school board member in Falmouth. Not. Mary, why are you? Falmouth makes. Yes, Michael. There's a tax rate valuation basis, so. Please. 
Anything else I can answer for you? Uh, no, no, just in terms of the mechanics. So the, the ultimate budget we approve will be a dollar amount. That's correct. Uh, we don't do that. Town, council sets the tax rate. So we'll, we can give you an approximation. Right, but in terms of the tonight, we can adopt a, we adopt the dollar amount at this meeting or a future this meeting. You can adopt the dollar amount at this meeting and yeah. then you formally adopt the whole budget at your April business meeting to move right. forward yeah. to the council. Mm -hmm. Michael, um, I have a procedure question. For the people who are watching this at home, if they have questions and concerns about the budget, is this, um, they won't have time to reflect on what we talked about tonight? Okay. There's always uh, well, the public the, hearing or public comments. Sure. At our uh, uh, well, meeting. yeah, and there's uh, ultimately they're going to vote on it. Okay. So, so there's um, we have to vote once, and if they if we can't constantly allow them to have comments, they ultimately have the ultimate comment. They can well, approve or not approve it. Okay. And then, um, but questions will always come in. I'm just well, people can answer questions, but I think we need to take a vote and approve a dollar number, but we're not going to move forward. I didn't know whether you were asking, should we put off no, approving a figure a, until they get a chance to talk? Well, they've had notice of this meeting. We're going to vote on a number and get it done. Well, it's just the way that the process goes, that people can comment, but then we have a discussion, and so, so if they have other comments. Essentially, you're adopting a number to move forward to the business meeting. You make your final decision at the business meeting on the budget, so you still have the opportunity Thank to you. hear a comment and make amendments to the budget Thank at you. that meeting. Yeah, Perfect. Good. But I would, you do have that opportunity, but it, you know, this is the closing, the end part of the, the budget, um, you know, so. Yeah, I think, I think I would say the only thing that perplexes me, I'm ready to vote on our, on our budget expenditures on the revenue side. My only hesitance, and I wish we had answers, David, so we didn't have to play around with this, but the town's also going to take a bit of a bump with the library. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's a year it would have been nice if we could stay as absolute rock bottom as possible. That would be my one comment, but not knowing where the state's coming in, I, I hear you on that. Uh, and you want to have a healthy contingency, so. One percent's the lowest figure I think I've seen in six years, seven years, eight years. Okay. So based on the changes that you talked about, the $110,000 difference, and this is, again, my best guess because the town council hasn't made its final decisions on its budget either, but based on what we know of their budget, the total um, tax impact for voters is a 3.3% increase, so that would include town, school, community services, and county tax. <coughs> for the school department alone, it would be an $0.18 cent per thousand dollar increase, going from $12.19 per thousand to $12.37 per thousand is a 1.5 percent increased school only. Right, so that, uh, that would be, uh, exactly it is, it's just about Correct. what you proposed. Yeah. 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 So you can see it. You can see it. If it's good. So, yeah. so another way to look at it, if you pr approve this and someone said, how much would my total taxes, total taxes, how much would the, my property taxes increase if I approve the budget? Your property taxes would increase 1%. 1%. Now, that's just mm -hmm. the school incremental over the total town taxes. Right. Um, and I agree it would be, uh, you know, um, you know, 
a two point, uh, what would it be, a 2.15% expenditure increase, 1% uh, tax rate increase is, you know, I'll let the voters decide, but it's, uh, I'd have to go back and look, but it would be the smallest tax increase in a while. Nine um, years. From the school. From, from the school. Yeah, and we're only responsible for the school um, budget. Is it one percent or one point five percent? which way you count. Oh, one percent increase in the tax, the taxes for school only from last year or from current year to next year. It's one percent going from nineteen cents over twelve dollars and nineteen cents is a one percent uh, increase. Well, the school tax rate only, if it's eight, it's twelve dollars and nineteen cents is the tax rate. School department only. Out of sixteen eighty, and our taxes are due April fourth, by the way, or something like that. But right. of the sixteen eighty, twelve dollars and nineteen cents is schools. Seventy two percent of your taxes are for schools. Mm -hmm. The budget we're proposing would it would go from twelve nineteen to twelve thirty seven. School department tax rate only, mill rate over a thousand would increase one and a half percent. School, that's school over school. That would be an 18 cent uh, mill rate increase. School over school, that'd be one and a half percent. Over the total town tax rate of 1680, it would be a one percent increase. So someone says, why are there two different numbers? Well, there's, there's two different questions. So someone says, well, you know, there's, if you want to know how much of your tax is going to go up if you improve the budget. Your taxes only from 100%. school increase only over total town taxes. It would be one percent, one you know, one point oh seven percent. That's what people understand. Yeah. They don't right. understand that one. No. <laughs> I don't blame them. <laughs> one percent sounds good. Let's go. We'll just go with one percent. We'll round it down. It's a happy number. <laughs> That's why you know. He said you gave me two numbers. It's like you asked yeah. me two questions. No yeah. right. Um, yeah. um so, so <coughs> do we, um, Joe, do you want to make, uh, it's not in a public business meeting, but we do a straw we vote. We do a straw vote to accept the budget numbers of $23,740,044 or a 1% <coughs> school budget increase over the previous year. That's the number we're voting on. Or it's a number. All right, so it it's would be this number. Correct. Twenty three million seven hundred and forty thousand forty four dollars. Right. Or one point or just yeah. Just one just percent just increase. I, I would just, just use a dollar. Twenty three million yeah, twenty three million seven hundred forty thousand and forty four dollars. Expenditure budget. And the expenditure, expenditure budget. budget. Right. Because you'll have a slightly different percentage depending on which question you ask, but there's in no a local dispute what the amount is. Right. All right, and a local property tax increase uh, or local property tax a portion of appropriation of twenty million five hundred thirty-six thousand three hundred fifteen dollars. Everyone, all right. Can we just take a strong vote on the number, and then we don't care about all the percentages? Yep. So straw vote for the twenty-three million seven hundred forty thousand forty-four expen uh, in expenditures for two thousand fifteen sixteen. All those in favor? You, you're up. Okay. Yeah, I, I raise it. You, I okay. can't help it. It's yeah, a big-headed guy. Anyway. All right. So I don't have to any of those. Seven. Okay. Fantastic. All right, thank you. For, well, are there any other questions? I, I just want to say this is a, always an incredible, enlightening process. And the amount of work that the administrative team and the teachers and the community have put into this is impressive. I think we have an incredibly engaged community in our schools. Um, and I thank you for all that hard work that you've all put in. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.